Today we're going to look at wedge fitting. So one of the questions we get asked most often is about how do you fit for wedges indoors? Uh, now we've got a lot of tools at our disposal with you know, the track man, uh, the options we've got to interchange from heads and shafts, but it's often a question if we're not on turf and not in real sand, how do we, how do we work out what the best wedge is for someone? So we're going to just go through kind of the basis of how we'd run through that session uh, and, uh, and explain a few bits about, about wedges, about bounce, about how, how you work out what's right for you. So always the first point uh, in a wedge fit is working out what's your starting point. So what's your pitch wedge distance, essentially, because that gives you the, the maximum, the top end of your wedges, and we're then looking at how do we graduate that back to, to around the greens. So I'm going to hit a few whilst we run through, so just to explain kind of how that process works. So I'm going to hit a few pitch wedges, give you that base distance, and then go through each stage from there. So we're trying to work out what's the, the longest end of your wedges. So... You know, and also by looking at a few pitch wedge swings, it helps us understand the technique a little bit as well. So I'm going to hit a couple. We generally we get kind of three or four decent hits, just just trying to get a gauge on where distance-wise you are with that club. There's a bit of a pull, um, so I know that I'm you know, full out. I'm generally about a 135 with the wedge. So that should be pretty close to that. Um, so one, two, seven. So I'll do one more. But that gives us an indication of the type of, actually the way you swing as well, so looking at angle of attacks and delivery patterns too, which that plays a part in, in how you set the wedges up from a bounce point of view. So let's see where we get to there. Yeah, one, three, three. So that's a very representative wedge for me. You know, I know I can't. There's no point you trying to force it beyond 135. It starts to get out of control. As you can see, my kind of OK hits are just under 130. So that gives a bit of a kind of a, a, a gauge as to right, what's, what's a comfortable distance range. So looking at you know, 133 on the last one through the air, 126 on a kind of an average swing there. So um, that gives us our start point. From there, we can start working back. So the longer someone hits their pitch wedge, the more distance you've got to cover down to the green. So whereas if, you know, if a player hits their pitch wedge 100 yards, they've got 30, 30, 35 yards less to cover with the wedges. And then kind of how we look at what we want the wedges to do changes slightly. So um, for me, you know, at that sort of yardage, I'm looking at putting, you know, I've never been great with my wedges. My strength has always been mid, mid to long irons. Um, so I'm better at full swing. So for a lot of players, but certainly for me, it's better to have the extra wedge at the bottom bit of the bag because I don't want to be playing lots of delicate finesse shots. That's never been my strength. Whereas a very good friend of mine is a ridiculously good wedge player. So um, you're looking at kind of how does someone view their wedges? What type of shots do they like to hit? Things like angle of attack, delivery patterns. Um, that's where you start to move into bounce. But so there are, there are also a few question marks like, are there any key distances on the course you play? So the course you play regularly and the conditions you play regularly also form a massive part of why you go to certain wedge setups versus others. So you know, I've got a par three on my course, which is between 110 and 120 yards. That's, and it's got drop offs on the front and the right and the back. And it's not a, not a shot you want to be kind of manipulating if, if at all possible. So those sort of things you want to try and take into account. So um, the first stage would be, right, what, if we were to take standard distance gaps, you're looking at roughly 13 to 15 yards. If we were to take standard dot loft gaps, sort of four, four degrees or so, you're looking at 130 to 135, 115 to 120, 100 odd yards, 85 yards. So as a kind of start point, if I were to graduate that back, is that something that in print, in concept works for that player and where they play? If you're starting at 100 yards, then you're looking at 85, 70. Um, if you were to take it a wedge down, then you're down at sort of 55, 60 yards. So those are sort of the start points. And then, then we're saying, okay, well, does that work for where the person plays? You know, where do they play? What turf types? What kind of ball flight do they like to see? Are you playing on a seaside links course where actually it's most important to play a little quiet knockdown shots, lower spin? Are you playing on a, on a sort of parkland course? Uh, lots of hazards around the greens where you, you want to be playing kind of full shots, maximum spin control. So there's no absolute right or wrong when you get to wedges. There are lots of shades of grey. There's no kind of black and white element to it within reason. So you're trying to fit the wedges to the person and where they play their golf. So I say for me, you know, the natural next one back, 
I'm going sort of pitch wedge, gap wedge. So as I say, I'm, I'm much happier playing full shots. So I want those consistent distance gaps back. So with my, my pitch wedge at 45 degrees, um, I'm going to 50 degree next to fill that 115, 120 yard gap. So you, you work into each of these where we've got the, the different wedge heads on the attachments where we can switch different lofts and different shafts in. Um, you then start to build that, that picture back. So again, first step would be that next club back. You know, you're looking to kind of tie into, you know, does that, does that loft produce the distance that we want to see? So I'm looking to see 115, 120 yards. So again, sort of stock shot. And that's also if someone wants to hit for it. So it's a fuller shot as you're comfortable hitting as well. Um, so if I'm hitting a, a fairly full swing with this, then, then we should see that. 116 yards so that straight away we know 50 degree that's tying in very closely to the kind of distance gaps that that reflect that sort of 15 odd yard gap back from pitch wedge so um, straight away we know we're into the right kind of ballpark and say it fits where I play my golf as well the par three distance it's it's a comfortable shot to play um, we'd take that process further so we'd go go through each each sort of set of loss take that process back a little bit further again look at a 55 degree put that club together and say does does this all track back does this all make sense are we seeing the kind of shots that the player wants to see from a distance point of view so yeah, slightly quieter swing 99 yards again we're into that into that that gapping, that consistency gapping that we're looking to achieve. And this can often be a case of just you know, fiddling around with lofts a little bit. You might go 49, 53, you might go 51, 56. It's a case of manipulating those around to, to get those gaps and to get those comfortable shots in as well. So loft is one element to it. Um, you, there, there are players that are gonna be comfortable using loft and seeing a high ball flight. There are gonna be players that really don't like to see a high ball flight. And you've got to be sympathetic to that with the loft and not, not making someone have to hit full shots if they don't really want to. So, but generally speaking, looking at that kind of four to five degree loft gap tends to give, you know, as we're through the set of irons, a nice sort of balanced distance, distance back. But without doing the testing, you don't really know. So it's a case of getting, getting those lofts in play and seeing what distances come out. From that point on, the other bit comes to shaft. When you're doing those distance checks, you're looking at how someone swings the club. Uh, my, you know, my gap wedge set up, you know, the type of shots we're looking to hit, that's a, a more of a full swing club, more a shorter version of pitch wedge. So what I've done with my set is match the, match the setup from my gap wedge to my pitch wedge to the rest of the irons because it's a kind of a full approach shot swing. Uh, I then go slightly heavier into my gap wedges for the, for the partial shots. This isn't a rule of thumb. You, historically, you'd always say go heavier into the wedges. It's, it's, it's more control. Um, but that's when the dynamic old wedge shaft was the only thing around. So heavy, heavy and stiff, and or heavy is sort of control based was the theory that was used in the past. This really boils down to how you move the club. So I'll do a bit of a demo here. So if you're someone who like, like me, I get a little bit, little bit laggy, a little steeper, and pull down on the club. Um, for those partial shots, the worst thing you can do for that kind of action is actually lose the feel for the bottom end because the moment you lose weight in the club head, you get laggy, you're gonna throw the club into the ground and get a bit steep. So I've got to put weight in the bottom end to complement that little bit of a slightly narrower, slightly handle forward to use that weight then to drop it into the back of the ball. If you get someone who's very dead arm, the worst thing you can do is go weight in the bottom because it's then gonna create that lag and gonna get stuck. So again, all you're doing is creating lots of hand action, unnecessary hand action through the ball. So again, from a club, from a club setup, you've got to be sympathetic to technique. Uh, so you know, the more you're a, almost a sort of Jason Day and, and just body rotation through, the worst thing the club can do is want to create that lag and drop in. If you're more of a, you know, realistic kind of a, Mickelson's got that kind of laggy, kind of handsy action, you've got to, You've got to have the weight in the bottom end to be able to use that weight because of that pull on the handle so that allows someone to lag and drop it in so the very different levers and how you deliver the deliver the club ultimately so we'd be using the shaft and the balance profile to help tie into someone's action because uh, that's going to dictate strike so dead weight balance point 
that's going to allow someone to, to control the club and find that same bottoming out point consistently. That's really the key to contact. Um, you know, your pace control, the swing, the distance control, flight control, that's really dictated by that in the same way that it is with the full swings the player being in control of the club and not having to, you know, if you get out of balance, then the worst thing with the wedges is it changes, gets behind. The worst thing you do is stand up out of it. That's going to create a thin and a fat and face rotation. We want everything to stay nice and in sync and balance through because you can stay in posture. You can put the club in the same spot each time. So that's really where shaft in particular, you know, head weights for some clubs as well, but shaft weight in particular comes in for that side. And there's a little bit of feel in there as well. Um, but predominantly, if you can get that strike right, then you can really start to make the most of the other aspects of the club, which are the bounce. Um, you know, bounce is something which there are been various explanations for it over the years. Part of the problem is there's, you know, they should really kind of, wedges really now should be called low, mid and high bounce because the numbers on the bottom, the, the angles, the bounce angles, so like for example, uh, I'll grab these two in particular. So you've got a, a Vokey wedge 6004L, so their lowest, lowest bounce wedge. And we've got the, uh, the high toe, which I don't know whether the color of it is visible or not, 6007. So you'd think that the Vokey wedge would have less bounce because it's got a lower number on than the high toe, which has got seven degrees versus four. What that number actually is, is effective bounce. So that wedge there has reasonable peak up there, so up and over. That wedge is a much shallower profile. It's a flatter, flatter profile. So actually, how visible is side by side, but the Vokey, this one, has a steeper angle here, a higher peak to that sole. So actually it's got more bounce on than this. The reason it's got the four on it is because of that relief on the back edge and the, and the fairly narrow sole makes it play effectively quite a low bounce. So it is quite a, the bounce aspect of the wedges is actually quite a difficult one to understand because of exactly this. Um, it's really a case of looking at the shape of the sole the number on the bottom is a reflection of the bounce, but it is not the bounce that's actually on the wedge. And again, if we put, grab another one here. Um, if we look at the D grind, using the Vokies because of their varieties and bounce, the D grind here, that says 12 degrees of bounce. That has substantially more than 12 degrees of bounce on. But again, because the back edge is graduated off, the effective bounce as they're calling it, is 12 degrees. If they put the actual angle on the sole of the club, the problem is no one would buy it because it would say about 25 degrees. Um, but the most important point is that it really suits certain delivery types. And that's really where, when we're starting to look at bounce, that's where we go. We're, we're looking at how does the player deliver the club and, and what are the sorts of turf and sand conditions that you play in. Um, because and that's why I, I would almost prefer them to put low, medium and high on them because Bounce is a combination of the angle, the shape, the width, um, and, and how, that, how that bounce actually graduates off. So you can have quite a wide sole that plays very low bounce. You can have a narrow sole that plays very high bounce. So it, it's a very complicated, it's a much more complicated element than it, in some respects, it should be. But actually working out the right one, once you get the right one, suddenly that consistency of contact and the versatility of shot can go from being a, a club where I think, God, I can't do anything but chunk this to, or thin it to where well, I can really get the strike clean. So first key to this is, you know, we're looking at things like, if we go back onto the data screen, we're looking at things like you know, angle of attack. Um, we're looking at, from a technique, when we watch someone swing, you know, how are you delivering the club? Are you, are you someone that you know, comes, and work to the front here, are you someone that comes into out shallow through? I think if you do that, you're delivering front edge. Are you someone that comes out to win? Um, you know, throws the club down at it because that way you're delivering a, a completely different part of the sole. So there are many bits that go into the melting pot of why a certain bounce is going to work. You know, do you play on firm, tight links turf? Do you play on, I mean, the ultimate example is you know, London clay. You get brutally firm 
you know, rock hard turf in summer, horrible soft claggy turf in winter. So actually for, for UK conditions, we, we would generally always advocate having some versatility in there. You know, if we were on the, uh, in sort of in, you know, parts of Florida in, uh, in the States, you're gonna get overseeded turf or kind of Arizona. You've got turf that doesn't really change year round. There's no real kind of root structure to it because it's, it's seeded every year. So you get that kind of exploding effect uh, where there's no real, you know, the club goes into the turf quite easily. There's no real kind of resistance to it. And there's no divot to be spoken of because it's just exploded into a million pieces. Whereas over here we get that, you know, chunk of turf, hopefully if we've got it right, a chunk of turf that comes out that you plop straight back in. There's a lot more resistance to the contact because the root structure underneath has bedded it together. Uh, and then you've also got the way the, the, the grass leaf here is much thinner, it sits down to the ground. So you've got a firm base and a thin grass that sits onto it versus no real root structure and thick turf that sits up. So you need totally different things from the sole profile for one style of turf versus the other. I say in the UK in particular, kind of you know, Northern Europe, we get a lot of differentials between different times of the year, different sands. So we would always advocate having a variety of bounces, having a, a bit of a, a progression of bounce through the set so that you've got the option of, you know, if you've got a very soft, which we've got the right one, a very soft set of conditions, you know, I can open out my sandwich, my 56 degree, to create a lot of bounce on that back edge for very soft, claggy, heavy conditions or very soft sand. Or alternatively, I can square off my 60 degree and leave a much tighter sole shape here rather than a heavy back edge. Basically creating the same loft, but giving very different bounce profiles. That's really key when you get the differential in the turf because you know, you're, you're, this is why actually fitting indoors is not, is not really a negative because we, we encounter so many different lie types and turf types and sand types that actually, even if you get fitted on turf outdoors or sand outdoors, you're only, you're only hitting off one type. So anything that anyone does is an indication of the bounce that's required, but really how you play your shots, how you deliver the club head, and you say the type of shots you hit and the type of course you play regularly, those are the real keys because we're always going to encounter lies that we hate, you know, a wet upslope. For me, I get the handle forward and get steep. A wet upslope in winter just means if I get my technique wrong, it's a fat. There's nothing the club's going to do to stop that happening. We can try to protect against it, but if we go too far one way, then you actually make it not very versatile for firmer conditions when you want to open it up. So it's taking all of these bits into account. So I'm going to show how we, how we look at the bounce and how we work out what works for someone and what markers we use. Um, so I'm going to use a, sort of a, a couple of different setups. So we've got, uh, let's start with, we're going to look at two very different sole shapes. We're going to use one of the Mizuno wedges here, which has got that shallower profile. These are both 60 degree wedges. And then we've got the, the D grind there with much more of a peak here. Um, and we're really looking at where across the sole front edge, back edge, heel, you know, which part of the club, which part of the sole are you using to make, to take the majority of that contact with the turf? Because that shows us where the majority of your strike point is. That also shows us the bottoming out point, you know, how you're delivering the club. Um, so we look at a couple of different shot types and see if we can see a pattern. So um, indoors, we've got to use a surface that gives us a bit of resistance that puts a mark on the sole. Uh, Outdoors, you'd look at you know, turf types, divot shapes, um, and whether, whether the contact's clean or not. Um, but actually, in terms of gauging exact strike point on the sole, this actually is one of the only ways of doing it. Um, it doesn't look ideal, but actually it gives a, a brilliant indication, a brilliant visual as to how that product's working for you. So, so what I'm gonna look at initially uh, sort of two two different delivery types so one is where someone puts the the shaft you know the ball back in their stance a little bit and tends to get on top and drive onto it and the other is going to be someone who plays it more central and shallower uh, and just some fairly standard standard sort of half sort of feel swings rather than full shots here so first one here this is with the lower bounce which if i get my weight onto the front side and drive onto it So what we then see here is that the, 
primary contact, like start contact point, is very near that front edge. So essentially what's happening there is to get the first strike point there, it's got to come in quite sharp to that leading edge. So you can see that downward angle there. That sharp leading edge creates, particularly when it's soft and wet, a bit of a difficulty. Um, certainly a complication for getting consistency of strike. It's very easy then to catch just a fraction of turf too much and to, and to dig it into the sole. So I'm then gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna go in more central, more level in terms of start, and shallow out a little bit. So you more, you know, we did earlier, more the kind of the Jason Day style. Um, and we'll see a very different mark on it. So I'm going from here to here. So just squaring off that shaft angle rather getting it too, le too length forward. I'm just gonna rotate, body turn, quiet arms, soften that off. So coming a little bit shallower. And what we've got there is a totally different strike point. So much more towards the back half. Um, and so what that's showing there is that where I've come in shallower, it's delivered, delivered the club head there rather than there. So with that strike point, we can see the leading edge up a little bit off the, off the ground. So what that shows us is, you know, we, we would much rather see that dominant strike point in the middle third of that sole, because that shows you've got a little bit of leeway at the front, a little bit of leeway at the back. You've got, you're using the majority of the sole to take the contact, which gives you, you know, as much kind of bargaining room, depending on the lie and how you deliver the club, you've got the versatility each way. Uh, and you also, you know, the more sole you can use, the more that club can, can slide through and kind of take the contact and, and have a, a, a forward move. The back edge is too proud. Then as you come in, it's going to literally kick and bounce. The front edge is too proud. It catches and, and then it's a flub. You know, it's a fat shot. So, you know, with those two different, I'll put them both together there. So you can see there the two different delivery patterns. One's created a very, very, you know, a longer mark, but a very much more front edge contact. And the other's created slightly wider mark, but much more across the center. So you'd be using you know, this sort of sole shape for that shallower delivery because it sits a little bit less peaked, sits a little bit shallower off. Uh, you then look to, I'm gonna put another head on with steeper bounce profile and do the hands forward delivery. We should see a bit of a different contact pattern on it. So we're gonna go to that D grind. And so for the, for the more kind of standard pitch shots, you'd use this as your start point, saying, right, how would you play a kind of a stock knockdown pitching swing? Um, and then from there, it's really a case of looking at, right, what are the specialist shots someone's hitting? You know, how do you play your bunker shots? Um, you know, you may well do, we'll kind of come into the lob wedge side of it after. This is sort of looking at going to be needing one to cover one shot type off, and then maybe a slightly different profile for the, for the higher loft wedge. But if I put the, the hands forward steeper delivery onto this one. We then, and I'll get that other label again to compare. We've then got a really great delivery pattern, great bounce pattern. Um, contact points so much more. There's so, as you can see, there's so much more of the sole making contact with the turf and the ground. That's what we're looking for. That's what gives you that protection. You know, it's not, it's not on that leading edge. We've got that little bit of leeway front, a little bit of leeway at the back. So that gives you your kind of base look at why a certain kind of heavier bounce about or shallower bounce might is going to work for someone. You then look at right then, how do you play the other shots, the in-between shots? Are you someone, are you someone who opens the club up to play your delicate shots? Do you just play the shot square? And you can, you can manipulate those shapes. We, you know, we've got, in the workshop, we've got a grinding wheel that we will take that base shape. So in taking this one, for example, if I'd say, right, that's great for my stock shots, but what I then do around the greens is I then open it up. Well, then you've got to start to look at, right, how do we, how do we use the width and that, that initial part of the head that we know strikes brilliantly on a standard, standard pitch shot? How do we then manipulate the sole to make that work? And that's where you'd look at, um, you know, say for this one, where that peak is. We like, we like the strike that's there. 
but if you open it up you start to put it onto that crest there so there's a little bit of a ridge that we'd look at grinding off and smoothing off and giving that versatility to the different shot types so getting someone to play play a shot they would play a bunker shot play a shot they play a little cut up um, and you're, you're just trying to find the best combination of setups and so it's kind of it, it is ultimately it's the best compromise of everything um, because you can have shot clubs that are great for the stock swings you have great for a lob shot but we do all sorts of club shots with these wedges so they've got to cater for as many as possible um, so it's saying right which which ones are the, the the kind of stock swings that we really need to make sure are spot on and then going into the more occasional shots and i say in the uk you'd then you'd then have most likely a slightly heavier bounce on your middle wedge, your sandwich, um, assuming you've got three, um, and then a, a slightly lower bounce where, where you're not gonna have to go as extreme opening up. Um, you might use, again, one of the things you can use for forgiveness is actually width. You know, having a slightly wider sole gives you more club head to use to make that strike. So for someone who literally just you know, stands and plays shots square, you don't have to have all this sort of grinding on the heel side uh, and that kind of cambering on the back edge. You might roll the back edge a little bit, but you don't need the heel grind um, because that only takes effect when someone opens it up and brings the club in that way. It's the heel side taking the strike first. So you're basically putting everything surrounding how someone plays their wedge shots into the melting pot of, right, what's going to suit this goal for the most. Once you know that, you can then say, right, we know that this sole shape, sole profile, you know, amount of bounce works what head options give us that um, it could be a finish you know, adding into that you've got you know, obviously you've got things like that that's a, a completely different visual down at the ball some players prefer a darker head finish i've always liked the kind of the matte finish of the raw heads it sort of frames the ball takes the glare out you get other players that would play the chrome because they like the way it tracks off the irons it gets confidence um, wedges are, are so heavily about confidence the short game is trusting that the shot's going to come off anything you can do to bolster someone's confidence is a good thing uh, going back to the amount of wedge side of it there are sort of two two base theories one would be the more wedges you have the more options you've got and um, the less you've got to manipulate the club to get the distances and to fill those gaps and then the other one if you look at someone like shane lowry who plays pretty much every shot with a 60 degree um, there are players who just are, like to get comfortable with a wedge and, and adding another wedge in can just complicate the matters because well I could use that one or that one so there are times where actually less is more um, particularly you could argue for you know for the, the, the less elite level golfer that you know, in a lot of circumstances the high loft the 60 degree loft wedges the kind of the extreme lob, lob wedges up at 62 64 actually create more issues than they solve um, because you've got to hit them so hard to get them to go anywhere that it becomes a full swing and that's a slightly dangerous thing with a wedge so it's really and so there are so many elements that you've got to be conscious of and sympathetic to that it's really kind of working with the player to say right this this overalls the base of the best base point um, and building out looking at the shots they take and building out the recommendations from there um, the and so we've, got, we've touched on bounces before um, it's really you know there are there are so many different shapes i think um, you know, one of the club head styles that's come in a little bit more over the last three or four four or five years are things like, like the tailor the high toe and you've got Callaway had the um the, the pm grind uh, where they're going for that and you know, full full face full face of grooves slightly higher toe you know the ping eye wedge was the one that started it all off um, it's you know, this sort of wedge suits is designed really for somebody who opens the blade up a lot more where the ball starts to strike up towards the top of the face so the principle of that it gives you more groove more face to make that contact with them to get the grip on the ball um, so again your bunker shots in particular that that higher you can see actually from that angle on the back it's got a slightly thicker it's got a slightly thicker bit right on that toe end there so that's moving the weight up the top end up to that top end of the wedge so actually through the shot what that does is it actually works the head underneath a little bit more so particularly for the shorter delicate shots these wedges if you're someone who's not great at playing the little cut-ups but you be wonder wedges are going to help with that 
quite often these sort of wedges are great for that. Again, they're giving you that, that extra, extra little bit of face to get some grip out of, you know, versus you know, one, I mean, they're all spreading the grooves further out than they used to, but technically, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily be wanting to strike that part of the face, but the more you open it up, you know, the more likely it is to get that part. And we can all see on old wedges, we've got the strike marks going out onto the toe from bunker shots and things. So the principle of those is to give you as much club head to get grip and spin as possible. Um, so it, it might mean having a specialist wedge, kind of a, a different wedge for your most lofted one to the other wedges within the set. Again, all these things, are, uh, yeah, there, aren't, there aren't too many questions you can ask in a wedge fitting, uh, in any form of fitting actually. The more questions you can ask, the more scenarios you can put forth, say actually, I do tend to do this in this situation, or I always come across this shot, so you know, where I play, there are a lot of you know, greens that sit above you. So you're often looking to pop the ball up and play it, you know, play it through the air and softer. So, all those bits go in and, and are helpful to know. The more the fitter can know, the better we can make the recommendations. Uh, the only other aspect with regard to wedges is, is often it's how often to change them. Um, now, one of, the, one of the main brands would say, well, you've got 75 rounds worth until that spin starts to degrade off. Ultimately, it depends how much you, how much you practice. Uh, if you're someone who tends to play all your bunker shots with one club, that's, that's more like sandpaper going across the face each shot you hit. So that's gonna wear the grooves a little bit faster. Um, if you practice somewhere that, that sands the practice ground heavily or that you practice area, short game area, again, same kind of thing. You're wearing the face a little bit faster. Um, the real key, I mean, for, for a lot of golfers who don't practice a huge amount, absolutely you've got a couple of years worth with a wedge. Uh, mine are getting towards, towards the back end of their lifestyle, um, lifestyle, life cycle. Um, what you're tending to look for as a key marker is between now with all the wedges, they're between the grooves, they tend to have small grooves, small raised markings, um, tread to get as much spin as possible. Once that starts to go, once you start to lose those markers, then you've lost that extra little bit of grip between the grooves. The other marker is at the, the top edge of the groove. Once that starts to round off, then again, you're losing that bit that bites into the cover. So the moment they start to round off and, and the between the grooves goes smooth, that's certainly a marker where you're losing performance. Um, you know, it can be, you know, if you're somebody who plays, I've always liked to play with quite a bit of spin and play to the flag. So for me, a fresher wedge, granted it means you've got to be a bit more aggressive, but that tends to suit the way I play them. If you're someone who doesn't like playing with a lot of spin, actually you'll start to hit a sweet spot performance wise of about probably six to nine months after you've bought them. They might spin too much when they're new uh, for shorter shots around the greens, but, but ultimately, you know, those particular markers on the face, those are the first ones to look for. Um, the other one is just where, you know, out of a bit of, bit of damp turf or a bit of rough, the ball starts to pop up. And um, that's also a sign that those, that face isn't gripping the ball because once it grips the ball, it actually pulls, the, the cover stretches a bit, it pulls it down, spins it more. So you get that lower launch, higher spin. So if the ball starts to flare up for you when you're playing pitch shots in, that's also another marker about changing them. Um, but I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight into the process of wedge fitting and how I should say indoors versus outdoors, we can take into account actually all, all the aspects you do outdoors, but without just seeing the divots fly. Uh, but any questions on any of the wedge fits, please do let us know. Um, you know. So the more questions, the better. That helps everyone involved and will help you get the best out of your products in the end as well.